the next segment uh, again uh, we are talk, going to talk more about features and we will talk about SIFT features, which are again a very interesting set of features. And this is uh, going to, at a high level, SIFT features includes both your HOG features, as well as like the the previous and the key point extraction. Uh, what we discussed, the corner detection, no, not exactly, but that's like the, the high level goal because you are the in in key points or uh, the corner detection. You are actually trying to detect the key points, right, which are more important. The HOG features, you don't care about key points. You are extracting features from all the possible locations. Now, the idea in SIFT is, what if we don't extract features from all the locations? What if we extract features from only salient regions or key points? And that's that's why like the first part is key point detection. You try to localize which are the important points, and then you extract HOG type features from those locations, okay? So again, this was like 2004, and it's it's a very uh, popular uh, paper. And I think last year it was like cited more than 68,000 times, which is uh, which is a huge number. So citation is something like that many papers have actually referred to this work, which which is I would say brilliant. Okay. So SIFT actually uh, the full name is Scale Invariant Feature Transform, and as the name says. These features will be scale invariant, which means that you might have your objects at multiple scales, even though even then your features are not going to change. Okay, you will still be able to capture uh, them pretty well. And the the idea is, okay. So as I said, like uh, these again, these features are first of all invariant to scale. They are also invariant to translation, which means that if you if you move your object in your input image still you will extract the same set of features and they are invariant to rotation which means that if you rotate your object still your features will not change again which is a very very powerful uh, feature and uh, of course they are invariant to scale as i as i said earlier okay so these are some interesting uh, properties of sif features now what we do is given an input given an input image we try to uh, extract like these uh, local features which are again based on key point uh, extraction. And I think we have seen this image earlier as well. So the idea is if you look at the image on the left, so this is a truck. And as a human, we can say that this is a truck. Of course, the orientation of this truck and the truck shown on the right image, it's, it's quite different, right? The orientation is different. The rotation is different. The scale is different. And as a human, we can easily say that these are like almost similar trucks, but for a computer with an algorithm, it's it's very challenging. Okay, so what SIFT does is, as we discussed, like SIFT is scale invariant, rotation invariant, as well as uh, the uh, as well as translation invariant, and we have all those three factors here in these two images. the The way it works is, you first try to find out the key points. Okay, and this is just giving like a uh, the the idea at a conceptual level. So these orange blocks over here, these will be the key points. Okay, so in this left image, the algorithm will detect like uh, these many key points. And one interesting aspect you can see that the the key point when it's located, you also have the orientation of that key point because these blocks are not just like vertical or horizontal right they are not perfectly placed there they have some kind of orientation some kind of rotation so that property actually helps you in making the algorithm scale invariant oh sorry rotation invariant because then you can handle rotation in your input images okay the second thing is you can see like these blocks are not not like same sized okay so these blocks are pretty small these are pretty huge so when we detect these key points, we, we focus on detecting the orientation. That was the first part. We also focus on the scale of the key point. Okay, for example, this key point, the scale is pretty small as compared to this one. And if we have that factor, then of course the algorithm will have like scale invariance property. Okay, so these are the key points on the left image, again, with the size of the key point, as well as the orientation of the key point. And what you do is, uh, what you do is for each key point, you adjust like the orientation. So you will just rotate it 
make it like a normalized uh, ori uh, orientation and then you will also like normalize the scale so that all the bonding boxes or all the uh, blocks you have have same size and then you extract those patches and that's what is being shown here okay so the orientation is aligned the scale is fixed and then these are the patches extracted from this image right and similarly this is like image of the same object but of course different orientation different rotation and there is some translation as well so you detect these uh, key points again and you can see that if you adjust the orientation adjust the scale the the key idea is you will get similar patch and if you're extracting similar patches for these two different images then whatever feature you extract for this particular patch that feature is going to match and if that feature is matching then you will be able to match these two images as well okay so that's the high level idea and of course when it, the algorithm will not be this perfect there will be some distortion in edges or some distortion in, in orientations and one you can see that you are not actually detecting equal number of key points as well. Okay, in this case, you have five different uh, key points. In this one, you have only three key points. But still, you will have all those uh, issues. But still, I think it will uh, uh, it will try to uh, do do its job. Okay, so let's try to understand like the the full algorithm first, like at a high level. Then we'll try to understand each of these steps in more detail. The first step is you try to perform scale space detection right so you you first try to detect like those key points but before doing that what you try to do, your your search space is actually actually pretty 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 huge and the idea is you will first of all search over all the possible locations but while you are searching you will try to search at different scales and that's the key okay so you will try to search at multiple scales. And this search process actually makes uh, it scale invariant. Okay, so that's the one important uh, aspect of this algorithm. And once you have that search space, in that search space, you will try to find key points. All right. And again, this key point localization, um, we have already talked about, I think, Harris Korn detection, right? That was a key point uh, detection algorithm. So this step you can just replace with Harris Korn detection or any other key point detection algorithm it doesn't matter the whole idea is you want you're interested in finding those key points okay so this is kind of a modular uh, step here now once you have that then the third important step is how you assign the orientation okay so for each key point we also need what's the orientation of this key point and once you have so this will give you orientation because you are searching at multiple scales that will give you a scale and of course, this uh, this uh, second step is going to give you key points. Then, having all this information, then you can you can adjust like the scale, you can adjust the orientation, and the final part is key point description, which is a feature extraction. And again, this step is kind of modular. You can use any feature extraction algorithm for this step. For example, you can directly use HOG, which we just discussed like in the previous segment. All right. So these two parts are like uh, kind of you can use whatever you want but the others are important, but this is like the full process. All right, so let's now try to understand uh, the, the search in multiple scales. And this is actually quite interesting. Uh, we'll spend uh, some time uh, uh, on this. So let's see how we can actually perform this automatic scale selection. Okay, so one brute force way will be, let's say you have this particular object which you're interested in. And you can see like this is much bigger scale, right? The object appears uh, bigger as compared to this one. But of course, this is the same object. Now, it's easier for us to say that these are the same objects because we are kind of, our vision system is scale invariant. It is very powerful, right? We, we can easily take into account that, okay, this is a smaller object and this is a bigger object. And taking that into account, we can say that, okay, these are the same objects. But the computer vision algorithm doesn't know that these, these scales are actually different. And it will try to match these two without, without taking that scale into account, and which, which makes it very, very challenging. All right, so let's see how we can do that automatically in computer vision system as well. Now, if you look into 
this yellow bonding box here so this is a very small bonding box and this is let's say is one key point present in this image now if we look at the same key point on the second image on the right which is which has a bigger scale of course the uh, bonding box will be much bigger if we have to look into the same amount of pixels which we are looking into the first uh, image right of course the number of pixels will be different but the actual visual content is actually similar when we take a much bigger bonding box okay so now the goal is how we can figure this out that okay this box is if the scale is 1x the scale should be 3x all right so let's try to uh, go over this uh, so what we do we start we again we do like a brute force uh, mechanism here but again I try to understand how this can be done automatically so we take like a bonding box it's a very small we started very small bonding box and we don't care because we don't know what are the scales in these two images okay we just assume okay they are different or they are same we, we we don't care so we start with a very small bonding box of same size and we let's say try to perform filtering at this location all right so this is let's say your kernel and some kernel and you're trying to capture some kind of response and let's say if the pattern of the kernel matches with the patch at that location then you should get get like a very high response right that you know from filtering so we start with a very small bonding box and we try to capture the response and what we do let's say we start with this so on the x uh, on the sorry on the x axis we have the scale which is kind of uh, giving you the size of the bonding box and on the y axis we have the response from the filtering operation whether the filter is actually matching with the image patch or not and that's the white dot over here and you can see that uh, when we start with this uh, scale on the left image then we are getting somewhat like a higher response but in this case we are getting a smaller response which could be because this size filter is actually matching very well with this location but not with this location and we know the reason because this this has a bigger scale right it, it will of course not match now what we can do is we can keep increasing the size of this bonding box and here you can see that okay the response is actually improving further which means the kernel is actually even matching better and even in this case the response is actually increasing okay so as we go right here you can see that okay maybe this scale over here uh so this is 3.8 right so some random scale and this tells you when your kernel size or your bonding box size is 3.8 then whatever kernel you are using it's actually matching perfectly with that image patch and that is giving you the highest response all right so which means that to be able to detect this particular pattern in your input image this is the right scale okay 3.8 and that scale is specific to this image and you can see that as you keep increasing the bonding box the response is going down because the the actual pattern which you're looking for it will it will no longer match right the visual features are actually changing and if you look at the second one you can see that again you saw like a peak but at a much higher scale which means that for this image this scale i don't know what this number is it's actually hidden behind uh, the transcript so this is let's say 10 right so a scale of 10 actually matches perfectly with this particular image now why this is interesting because you you're not changing the filter you are just changing the the size the size of the image patch on which you are applying the filter and if in these two images the same filter is actually giving you similar kind of response or you can say high response at two different scales then that in a way is telling you what is the scale difference between these two images okay which means that 3.8 like kind of bonding box is equivalent to 10 times of bonding box when placed on this image so that's giving you the ratio of the scale you have between these two images so of course you can automate this process right once you once you know that of course we have to update across like multiple scales and that's the idea which is used uh, when we extract uh, CIF features what we try to do is we try to apply these kernels or filters at multiple scales 
Okay, so that brings in like the idea of scale invariance into the set features. And visually as a human, you can see that, okay, whatever visual information you have inside this box actually matches perfectly with whatever information you have in this bigger box. All right, so now another question is, what should be like a very useful kernel function or you can say signature function which you can use across across images? And of course, uh, derivatives play a very important role here. And Gaussian is something which you know has been shown like very, very useful in the past. And what we do is we use like the second derivative of Gaussian, which if you remember, like is also Lapla uh, Laplacian of Gaussian, this, uh, this kind of curve, right? Which can actually detect interesting patterns in your input image. And it can help you in estimating like the variation in scales between two different images. Okay, so let's try to understand uh, how, how that works. So, your, so this is your first derivative of Gaussian. Again, if you compute derivative of this, you will get Laplacian of Gaussian and you know that looks like an inverted hat. I think we have discussed a lot about that. And that, that inverted hat, uh, inverted Mexican hat will look something like this. Now, if you look at this filter, this is kind of, if you try to visualize, this is kind of a blob structure, right? Whenever you have some kind of like very, very unique thing in your images. So what we can do is if we say that we are describing our key points in terms of blobs, then we can use this Laplacian of Gaussian to actually detect those blobs in your input images. Okay, and again, blob, this is just one example. You could, you could have like any other pattern as well, but even if we can actually detect these patterns in two different images, it will help you in estimating the scale, right? It doesn't have to be like any unique pattern. It's up to you, like what pattern you're trying to match. Okay, so let's try to do that using these blob kind of structures. Now, let's say you have these kind of blobs in your input images, and these are your kernels, which again are Laplacian of a Gaussian. And again, these you are using at different scales. So if you will have a small blob, something like this, then this, if this is matching with like the, uh, the size of uh, this kernel here, you will get a very high response, right? Again, this is just filtering. You are using this, this as an image patch and you're using this as a kernel. So you know that if you perform filtering, it's just doing pattern matching. So if you use uh, this, kernel, uh, this kernel, it will give high response for this particular blob because the size is kind of almost similar, right? But this won't give you any response for this bigger blob because this is like much larger scale, okay? So everything will be just filtered out. You, you won't get anything. And this red curve here is showing exactly that. Okay, so as you move from like the, the small filter on the bottom to the bigger filter on the top, as you're changing the scale, this red plot is actually showing you the response on this kind of input. Okay, so this curve tells you like for, for this blob, you will get good response for uh, this kernel, but you will get nothing for this bigger kernel and you will get nothing for this smaller kernel either. Okay, so this is matching with this. And again, if you keep increasing the size of the blob, then you can see that the kernel which will detect this blob is also going to change its scale. And for this bigger blob, you can see that this kernel is going to match with this. Right, so once you know that, why this is interesting, because if you use all these different scale kernels in your input image, then based on when you're getting higher response, you can actually tell what's the scale of your input image, okay? If you get higher response for this, you know that, okay, the scale is much bigger. If you get a higher response for the smaller kernel, you say, okay, the scale seems smaller. And in all this, the kernel is not changing. It's the same kernel, it's just a different scale. The pattern is not changing. It's the same pattern, it's just different scale. Okay, so that's the whole idea about having multiple scales and to be automatically able to detect like what's the scale of your input image. All right, so now what you do is given an image, right? You use like these multiple scales. These are the same kernels. And this is just showing you like uh, how you change the scale. And this is showing you a standard deviation uh, for that kernel. 
All right. So if you apply this kernel on this input image, this is the response on the right. Okay. So in a way, what you're doing is you're trying to detect blobs in your input image, or you can say that blobs is a term, but it's trying to detect important or salient regions in your input image. Okay. So this is like one way you can detect interesting points. And you can see, I mean, this is kind of performing edge detection. You know that I mean a double derivative is actually the filter used to detect edges. And that's exactly what this is doing. Okay, but let's keep it more generalized and say, okay, these are interesting points. Now you can see that, and again, you have seen this in your first programming assignment. If you change the scale of your kernels, or if you change the standard deviation of your Gaussian filter, then the type of edges you are going to detect that, that also varies a lot. Okay, so this is exactly showing that. Now, how you extract features from this? Once you have these responses from multiple scales, what you do is, you compute like maxima minima across these scales. Okay, so whatever step I'm going to explain, you will do that for all the pixel locations in all these scales. Okay, if you have five different scales, you will perform that operation for all the pixels in these scales. Okay, so let's talk about that step. So this uh, activation map here, if you represent that as, let's say, using this uh, horizontal uh, two by two matrix, and if you're interesting in this, interested in this uh, location, the cross over here. Okay. So what we do is we look into the neighborhood, right? Which is like the surrounding pixels. You will have eight different pixel values, right? In this uh, feature map. And you also look into, look into activation map from the next scale, okay? So it's coming from the next scale. And again, you will compute like these, you will consider these nine values as neighborhood of this pixel location, and again for the bottom. So for this location, what you do is, if the response is actually maximum among all these neighborhood pixel values, you will just store that as a interesting point. Okay, so, and you do that for all the pixel locations in all the scales. So what that will give you is, okay, let's say if this is the maximum among all these green dots, you will store the XY location Okay. And you will also store S. S is corresponding to the scale. Okay, so if this is one, two, three, fourth scale, you will just say, okay, the scale is four. So now what's happening? This way you will detect what are the key points in your input image. And jointly, you are also saying that, okay, this is the key point, and this is the scale of this key point. All right. Now, LOG filter, I think we have discussed this earlier, uh, how to get Laplacian of Gaussian, you compute second derivative, but there's a very interesting way how you can uh, optimize compu computation of this uh, Laplacian of Gaussian. So this LOG filter, and you can actually just compute difference of Gaussian. And that is a very good approximation for this Laplacian of Gaussian. And if you compute difference of Gaussian, because you have two different Gaussian curves, and you just perform difference between those two, that will give you this DOG filter, which is called difference of Gaussian. So in this case, it's interesting because you don't have to compute derivative anymore. Because to compute LOG, you have to compute second order derivative, remember? So it will be second order derivative of your Gaussian function, and that's computationally expensive. So if you want to save some cost, this is a very interesting uh, trick. And let's try to understand how a DOG is actually approximation of LOG. And I think then we will end it here. We are almost out of time. Let's me, let me let me cover this uh, this part. Okay, so let's say you have a Gaussian curve, a Gaussian function, which is shown in the green. Okay, so this has like some kind of uh, standard deviation and uh, some, uh, so let's say mean is zero, which is fine. Then what you do is you reduce the standard deviation of uh, that Gaussian and what you will get, you will get like this red curve. Again, this is a Gaussian, but with a smaller standard deviation. All right, now what you do is, you just take difference of these two, you subtract these values. And what you will get is, you will get this blue curve. I mean, I think it's interesting, you can do the math, but this is exactly what you're going to get. Okay, at this location, you can see if you compute the difference, it's this region over here, right? But it's negative because the green one has negative value, so it will go down. Okay. 
And if you compare this with the inverted hat or inverted Mexican hat, this, this looks exactly like that, okay? You have zero, then slightly positive values, then very big negative values. Again, the symmetry of that. So this uh, you can use in place of your Laplacian of Gaussian. It saves like a lot of computation uh, cost. Uh, 